Chris Mello, Jazz Studies Director for the Milwaukee Youth Symphony Orchestra, and welcome to the Jazz Heritage Festival. This is the 15th anniversary of the Jazz Heritage Festival, and it couldn't be any more different than it was from the beginning. Tonight, you're going to see performances from jazz alumni, our jazz combos, the jazz faculty, as well as interviews from Mr. Cliff Gribble and Manti Ellis. We hope you enjoy the Jazz Heritage Festival. I'm Cliff Gribble, founder of MISO Jazz Studies. Uh, we did that in uh, 2004. Well, my first job was at Washington High School, started in 1969 through 72, briefly in the Army, and I wound up getting a job at Washington High School for three and a half years. I had no intention of becoming a teacher. My dad had told me I perhaps shouldn't do that because they don't make any money. He ought to know he was a music teacher. Anyway, when they let me out of the Army, I got this job at Washington High School, and I thought, well, I'll stay there for a semester, make a couple of dollars, and go back to graduate school. I had a master's degree. <clears throat> By the time I got halfway through that semester, I had given up the idea of going back for a doctorate. Never looked back. They were wonderful, wonderful kids. We had a great jazz, jazz ensemble, won all sorts of festivals. But um, having done that, I thought, well, there we go. This is what I want to do with my life. Um, a couple of years later, as I said, in 72, my wife and I decided to move, starting a family, and I uh, wanted to go to a smaller place, so we went to Portage. I was there for nine years. They hired me as, uh, as band director and uh, jazz director by default, I guess. Two kids were born in Portage as well, so uh, lots of fond memories. Eventually, they sort of found me in the Milwaukee High School for the Arts and uh, they didn't actually say jazz director, but that was it, because that's who I was. And uh, when I got there, I said, I want this program to be just like the uh, magnet schools in Houston and Dallas. And they said, well, we were hoping you'd say that, and away we went. Well, I was there for quite some time, 17 years, and uh, we had time to really build up some fine groups, and we did a lot of traveling and winning, and stuff. It's not about winning. I would tell the kids, if you want to win, and that's all you're thinking about, we're not going to. If you're doing it for the music, and you're pleased with the music you did, you're probably going to win. Or at least you could. But the only chance you got is to enjoy the music. Just a wonderful experience for these kids, and some of them have um, worldwide careers, or at least national careers. Um, when I left uh, the High School for the Arts, I thought I had retired. This is in 2001. And um, it just got to the point where I thought, if I don't get an assistant, I'm going to die on the job. So I thought, how about you go out on a high note in 2001, and I quit. And I think it <laughs> may have saved my life. But uh, it wasn't just a couple of years later when uh, MISO, actually MISO contacted me earlier than that, before they built this building and gave me a tour of it and said, someday, why don't we have a jazz program here? And I said, well, let's do that. That's great. And in 2004, they called me. Next, I said, I'll start the program, run it for a couple of years, and then I'm going to re-retire, I hope. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> it was wonderful. We, we had a fairly large turnout, and some very nice players came in, but there was a really nice, obviously nice, jazz quartet available. Vibes, piano, bass, and drums. Uh, a variety of kids, but wow could they play. Next year we doubled our enrollment and there were easily 10 combos then and that's about the time that we had the first Jazz Heritage Festival to make the complete turn back. The Jazz Heritage Festival gets its name from the New Orleans version. New Orleans Jazz Heritage Festival. I've been there twice, once with uh, one of my combos. In any case, when I got home, I thought, let's do that here. We've got 10 combos that need to be heard at the High School for the Arts. Let's just divide them up that way. So I started something I called the Jazz Bazaar. Well, when I got to MISO, and I thought, now, why not combine that name with the concept that we had used at MHSA, and call it the Jazz Heritage Festival, the MISO Jazz Heritage Festival. 
So we started in 2006. We have a tremendous jazz tradition here in the city, and we have some people who actually were playing in the uh, Bronzeville area. By way of explanation, I should say that the Bronzeville area was approximately where the Mayak Center is now. It was a jazz era. Well, it turns out the jazz clubs were tremendously popular and the players were excellent. As a matter of fact, where MISO stands today, there was a jazz club. Some of the guests that we have on the show on that particular day in 06 had actually played in the club that's now on the spot where MISO stands today. Reuben Harpole, uh, often called the Black Mayor of Milwaukee, a wonderful, wonderful man, and his friend George Sanders were scat singers in many of the clubs in the Bronzeville area. Um, and Berkeley Fudge was a real youngster at the time, but he played in that club that was here and other clubs around the area. So we're paying tribute to that by uh, calling one of our combos the Bronzeville Jazz Quartet. Turns out it's our best one. And we're about, we follow that with Bronzeville Memories, starring Reuben Harpole, George Sanders, and Berkeley Fudge, both singing, playing, and talking. We also had community uh, participants. Jazz Unlimited, the Milwaukee Jazz Experience, Caroline's Jazz Club, the Jazz Estate, Hell Leonard Jazz Series, the Black Historical Society did a, uh, an exhibit as well, and as did the Woody Herman uh, Society. The combos themselves were um, named kind of interestingly. First year at the Heritage Festival, there was the Jazz Summit, and there was the Jazz Cornerstone, and the Jazz Assembly, and the Jazz Effect, and the Jazz Foundation, Jazz Outlook, Jazz Perception, Jazz Template, and uh, a combo called Apex and Bronzeville Jazz Quartet, which we invented specially just for MISO. Um, now, of course, within, I think, a matter of weeks, the jazz part got dropped. So they became Summit, Cornerstone, Assembly, Effect, all like that, and of course those names stuck and here we are today. We had been invited, and we knew it at the time of this first Jazz Heritage Festival, that we were invited to perform at the New York JVC Jazz Festival, courtesy of Downbeat Magazine. And uh, so they were working pretty hard even at this festival. You might be hearing some of that in the background as I speak. But it turned out to be a wonderful year, and uh, this was a good way to kick off the second half of it. Hi, I'm Jason Goldsmith with Apex, and we are about to play for you Wayne Shorter's classic, Footprints.
first alumni performance comes from Dylan Mansour. Dylan is a musician, composer, and educator living in New York City. While in Mysore, Dylan was part of the Jazz Studies program and Calypso, our steel pan ensemble. The performance you're about to see was performed live in Chicago at Piano Forte Studios. This performance also features another jazz alumni, Josh Catania, who you'll hear from more later in the performance. Here is the Eric Nathan Academic by Dylan Mansour. Hello, I'm Lyle Rivera, and I was in MISO from 2017 to 2019. One really memorable moment uh, for me about MISO was in my first year, I was put into the Bronzeville Jazz Ensemble with Neil, and we immediately started working on doing our arrangements, um, but kind of just saying what they were as opposed to meticulously writing everything out. I really ended up liking this because it gave us the ability to kind of bring in some different um, styles and textures into the music that we wouldn't have been able to do by just doing the standard interpretations. However, by still keeping things sort of improvisatory in the moment and in the moment, um, it really allowed for sort of more on the spot musical exploration and I really liked that. I still use this idea of sort of uh, more loosely orchestrating my music today, and I'm really grateful that I was able to first learn about this during my so.
tune you're about to hear is, we think, written by Lee Morgan. Uh, this is off of a transcription from Carl Fontana. It's entitled, Expubitant. Thank <laughs> you. 
Jazz in Milwaukee, his career, and the Bronzeville neighborhood. And found out a lot of amazing stories that we're here to share with you today. Until recently, that's something they renamed the area. It was mm -hmm. the Sixth Ward. And the other ward that was in trouble was the Third Ward. That's where all the Italians lived. And we butted up the Sixth Ward and the Third Ward. In the Sixth Ward, the city didn't get a chance to uh, just let it go into a ghetto because Slitz Brewery was the biggest brewery in the world. And it's right there on 4th and Galena. And Slitz had more equipment than the city did. And Slitz took over our whole area. They, every night they washed the streets. I mean, they had the crew out there, man, brooms. No glass, no rocks, all grass, everything it was perfect, man. You could eat off the sidewalk. And one of my neighbors was gold in my ear. <laughs> you know? That's so, amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I saw it from soup to nuts. All the guys that I came up with that I can remember were tops and what they did. Came up with Billy Wallace, who taught me from after my father got through foundationalizing me, he was a harmonic genius, you know? And he started teaching me because he wanted to play saxophone and he knew I could play piano. So he started showing me what he wanted me to do for him to play. And I, I did that and then I looked around, there's Willie Pickens, who's a monstrous piano player, and Bunky, the people don't know it, but Monk is, is he's, a, he's a world leader right now. You know, as far as innovation of, of the music and stuff, he's the cat. So that's what I came up with. So that's a lot of pressure right there. You got to either play or, or else, you know. Mm -hmm. and I played piano with Bunky for years because Willie and I were like, almost like brothers. We were together every day, every night, stayed out half the night, you know, and all that. Didn't do nothing wrong in the restaurant where you could put your nickel in the jukebox and you could hear Sonny Stitt, you could hear Bird, you could hear Diz, you know, George Sharon, all. and we hustle nickels and sit up there and play the jukebox all night. I got to be known as like a good piano player. I played with a lot of guys, man. I played with, uh, who was it, Art Farm, uh, of course, Lionel Hampton. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, let me see, Sam Jones, Max Roach, all I played with all of them right here in town because they didn't want to bring a piano player up for a session from Chicago. So I was, I was there, Bunky. They come up to see Bunky. I started out, I really, really learned about playing tunes with somebody with Martha Artis. And she used to come to my house because she don't know my cousins who were older than me and they, you know, they go out on weekends and stuff. 
And I had a piano. I was always playing when she comes and she'd always show me something on the piano. And she found out I played the guitar and she said, Well, when you get good enough, come on down and sit in with me. I'm playing by myself. So I did. You know, I got down there, I didn't I wasn't that good, but I was I was chesty enough to try. You know, and I, and she's done all kinds of tunes, man. She you know, she knew every tune from the beginning to the end, you know. And she just tell me what key and leave me out there scuffling, you know. And I, I learned, I stayed down there with her for a year, a couple of years or so. So Volpe uh, was assigned to Alfie's club up there and it was closed. And I was working with Ray Tabs at this time. And we were, had a trio, it was Ray Tabs, Hobbs, and myself, Bob Hobbs. Mm -hmm. And we went into Volpe's down there, which was Brothers Lounge or what they call uh, Yancey's place, what they, Jazz Oasis. And I went in there and Volpe, John Volpe Jr., he comes and he says, hey, do you ever think about having your own group? I said, no, because I was working with, you know, Ray and Bob. He says, I'm, I'm going to take over this club up there on Atkinson and in Appleton, where they run together, he says it's called, we're going to name it Alfie's. Would you like to have your own group in there? I never thought of that. I said, yeah, man, I'll do that. The principal band was Frank Luther, Berkeley, and Vic DeSoy. Berkeley and, and Vic and I, we all worked, and Frank, we worked together so long, you know, we got to be like a family. We had that club in that area, it was like, Every night for seven nights a week for years, you couldn't get in the place. Dizzy Gillespie came up there for convalescence after he got out of the hospital and worked with me up at, at Alfie's. Wes came up, played, Buddy came up and stayed. But like you asked the question, which was one of my favorites, well, Alfie's was the favorite. The Jazz Gallery was right there with Alfie's. And uh, I worked up there, I worked with a lot of people up there, man. I was just looking at TV the other night, and they were talking about Tony Bennett. My man was working at the, at the PAC, and he came up to the jazz gallery. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting in the audience, and we started playing Stella by Starlight. And he jumped up, and came up on the bandstand, and grabbed the mic, and says, man, let me have some of it. He came up, and, he, and then he got on, and he says, I always like to play with, with small groups like this, and that's one of my favorite tunes. I just couldn't help it. <laughs> and he, <laughs> that, that was the jazz gallery. And then in the jazz gallery, I, man, they brought everybody you could think of. Uh, what was it? The, the uh, Piper, Milt Jackson, John Lewis. I played with all those cats, man. I got to know them all. They got to know me. And uh, Cannonball, before he died, he used to come up there. And that's another thing, Cannonball, he recognized Bunky right away, you know. And I used to be someplace other than Milwaukee. And a couple of times I ran into Cannonball, and the first thing he says, man, what is Bunky doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, Train Stop is basically the influence that I got from Train, which, which really buried me in the music I got. Bunky went to New York. He had a gig, Charlie Mingus, and he stayed in New York a few years, and then he came back home. And uh, we used to always take a ride out to the lake, and sit at the lake front, look out over the lake. And, and so we got in the car, and we went out to the lake, and, and Bunky was real quiet. And he, now, I fucked the world of Bunky, and he says, man, there's a guy in New York. You want to hear from him, hear about him. This is way before Coltrane's name ever came up. I said, who's that? He says, because I think he's going to say Sonny Rollins. He says, no, his name is John Coltrane. He says, man. He says, I ain't never heard nobody like that. And I'm looking at him like I had never heard nothing like him. So a few years after that, train started, the name started to come up. And uh, he was over in Chicago at the Plug Nickel. And I was working at the Hyatt then, the brunch. And they did a Sunday afternoon session. I got off at 2 and their session started at 4 over there. So I said, I think I'll just run over and see what Bunky was talking about. 
I got me a seat right in front of the bandstand. Said I'm gonna see what Bunky's talking about. And it was nobody on the bandstand. All of a sudden, this guy walks up on the bandstand, kind of shabby looking, medium height, you know, maybe about 180 pounds, something like that. And he picks up his horn and he starts practicing. I heard him practicing and I started listening. Started listening some more. He's practicing on the bandstand by himself. No band, just him. He stood up in front of the microphone and started playing. McCoy Tyner came out from in the back. Jimmy Garrison came in. This goes on for about 20 minutes, man. And everybody else is just sitting on the bandstand listening to train practice. And this place is full. <laughs> I thought I thought training with Patty, he just went down deeper. Man, everybody forgot about that and started listening. And finally, Elvin came back, his eyes was this big, man. He went up on the stage and drums like that I never heard in my life. You know? It's, it was no no system or nothing, man. These cats just went up there and played. And I sit there and they played one tune. No melody. Nothing. Just train started playing and everybody else started playing. Hello, my name is Gino Sami. I'm the instructor for the Bronzeville Jazz Ensemble, and this is a composition written by the great Manti Ellis entitled Train Stop. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Josh Catania, and I was in MISO back in 2011 and 2013. Um, I played piano, and I think if there was a memory I had to share about my experience, it would be of rehearsals with my teacher at the time, our combo director, Russ Johnson, who um, would always have so much to share with us in rehearsals. But one day we were gearing up, ready to play, and we were just waiting on Russ to, to get there and teach us. And then the room goes pitch black. And we hear the words, make music. And we don't know what to do, but we uh, need to improvise something. We can't see the music, right? And we can't see each other hardly, so we learned really fast that music is a way to communicate and that it's far beyond what was just on the page and that there's a way to harness it as a language. Um, and that was a really profound lesson in that, that day. And so I guess those memories stick with you. So, um, you know, ask lots of questions of your teachers and, and just keep learning. Keep on it.
Gino Simon, I'm the instructor for Cornerstone, and we are playing a mashed up version, I can't remember who actually came up with this, uh, of all the kids, of Tenor Madness and Chameleon, which we are calling Chameleon Madness. Thank you. 
Our next alumni performance comes from New York City and Washington, D.C. Blues on Haven is a tune written by Alec Aldred and is performed as a duo with another Mysel Jazz alumni, Jake Richter. Alec is currently living in Washington, D.C. and is a member of the U.S. Army Band, and Jake just graduated from the Manhattan School of Music in New York City. We hope you enjoy this socially distanced performance from Alec Aldred and Jake Richter. Hello, my name is Neil Davis. Our combo is called Summit, and we're going to play a song for you called Invitation.
What's up, y'all? Uh, my name is Dylan Tracy. Uh, I was in MISO from 2007 to 2011, and I played drum set. Um, there are so many things that I can say in uh, in this video, but do not know if I'll have enough time um, about the benefits of MISO and everything. But uh, just a little bit about myself. I went to NYU, um, graduated in 2015 in jazz performance, and um, yeah, I have... have played with uh, a few jazz artists, currently play with a pop and R&B artist named Amber Mark, and uh, I also have my own band, Alto Palo. Really, my whole life is just built around being a freelance musician, doing a lot of recording sessions, writing a lot with people, and just really traveling and enjoying all that being a musician can bring to me. Um, I've met so many wonderful people. I've played at music festivals where I got to hang out with Herbie Hancock backstage. I got to share a green room with Robert Glasper once, and Justin Tyson and I played Madden for a little bit. Um, so, you know, the world has opened itself up to me really by what I learned at MISO and how I learned how to establish connections with other musicians, how to interact with them as players, um, and a lot of friendships and just really good sound advice that I got from all the instructors there. And, and really just understanding the beauty that is making music with people. Um, MISO does a really good job at a conducive environment for for sharing ideas and thoughts and and you know I remember a few times in in combos you know one of the teachers would pick out a talent that a certain other band member has and be like hey why don't we you know like do it like your way or you know there there was just so many opportunities for us to express ourselves and that really like instilled a confidence in me in how to be a um, band member a live performer. And also just, you know, hanging at the estate. That led me to opportunities to me playing at the estate as just outside of MISO and then joining bands, going on tour, and then just really knowing that, like, moving to New York was the perfect choice for me. It might not be the case for everybody. A lot of you might want to stay in Milwaukee, and that's totally fine because Milwaukee's got an amazing community and scene to, you know, really cut your teeth and, like, learn how to be a live performer and musician. And... There's so many opportunities for success, whatever you want to call that. Let's just call it making a living off of playing music. And it doesn't just have to be with live performance. You know, it can be with music production, songwriting, um, you know, even being a tour manager or, or being a, a stagehand, you know, because you know how to like tune a piano or tune a drum set or something like that. Like you just have those skills now. So, you know, the world's your oyster, and uh, I'm really excited to see what comes out of MISO from your group and other groups down the road. Peace. Who's 
to say that it was a real life pulling it up rolling down with the wind and arm Thank you for listening to the Jazz Heritage Festival, and we hope you come back tomorrow night for our second installment, featuring performances from our jazz alumni, um, the super band, and also our jazz combos and the jazz faculty. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye.